We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Uh, Welcome back to the therapy show behind closed doors with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook. And we're up to episode 144, Bob. Good God. I know. (laughs) Where does the time go? (laughs) And what we're we're going to be talking about in this episode is a really interesting title, Sequences of Psychotherapy. Yeah, just before I start that, I was attempting to say every time you say at the beginning of the podcast what number it is like 143 144 i often think i usually have the same reaction gosh i can't um add them how we've got 244 which is the same reaction i've had today so at least um, we're not to nearly three years we've been doing this bob time goes so power it goes so fast it's ridiculous isn't it when you think about it yeah, I'm in my 74th year. Wow. I know, when it goes like that. Um, Okie dokie then. Uh, it's about the <laughs> psychotherapy, really, this video. Um, when I sent the title in, I, I called it Sequences of Psychotherapy. And that's mainly because there's a marvellous book, and I can't remember who wrote it. And the book was called Sequences of Psychotherapy Process which is probably why I call this type of a podcast sequence of the psychotherapy process. When I think about it, really, for the listeners, though, what we are talking about is different stages the psychotherapy treatment goes through. Yeah. Now, when I went on my first training all those years ago, um, they never called um, this stages or sequences. They called the process a treatment plan. So they'd say, right, let's find a treatment plan for you, which is basically what we went through was the stages of the psychotherapy process. And Sounds very medical, that, doesn't it, a treatment plan? Yeah, yeah. I p- much prefer stages or sequence of a psychotherapy process. Yeah. The treatment plan. And, of course, in some ways, I used to think then, as I think now, yes, we can look at the overall picture of um you know the stage of the psychotherapy process um meta perspectively but we can also look at what goes on in terms of sequences of one psychotherapy session so you've yeah. got the 50 minutes has its own sequences as well if you like as as well as the overall direction of the psychotherapy process so According to whether you're a long-term psychotherapist or a short-term psychotherapist, there still will be overall sequences of a psychotherapy process, as well as what happens is in the 15 minutes as well. Yeah. So if we look at this in an overall way, I remember back in the day looking at we'll call it the treatment planning they called it then or we'll talk about in terms of overall stages of the psychotherapy process and they nearly all started with a phrase which we're used to now um in 2024 uh back then that was 1984 i think um and that is back then it was called creating a working alliance that's the first i like that phrase of a psychotherapy process. Most books would start with that um, stage that in the psychotherapy process, however long it took, your focus would be at the beginning in creating a alliance with your client. Yeah. And that was often called creating a working alliance. What do you like about the phrase? I just yeah. like the sound of it that it's it is a working collaboration between the two of you. It's not just you doing it to the person. They're they're involved in the process as well. Oh, you like the the aspect of a co created relationship. Absolutely, yeah. To your mind, when I said 
creating a working alliance. Yeah. I was thinking when you said that, I was thinking the next question which springs to mind, of course, is how does the therapist know when a working alliance or a co-creative relationship or that first stage, if you like, uh, which I think is so important, which I'll talk about in a minute. How do how do the therapists know when that's actually happened? It's think? a really good point. Yeah. <laughs> it's easy to say, isn't it? In a way. It's yeah. Like, okay, the, yeah, to us trainees, um, you know, the first stage is um, creating a working alliance. And I remember thinking at the time, we're 40 years later now, yeah, that's fine, but how do we know when that's actually happened? And when... that is really important. How how do we know? It's all right seeing it written down and that we need to achieve one and maintain one, but mm. yeah. So if we use that phrase working alliance as a first stage, then what is a working alliance? And then we can look at how do we know it's been created? Well, a working alliance is basically the fundamental relationship that you first cement with the client which includes things like trust yeah so there's trust between the two people um a sense of secondly a sense of knowing each other to a certain degree whether it's actually got a transferential bent on it or not um thirdly for me and i'm going to use a ta language again when there's been a comprehensive script analysis completed yeah I, I think that's why the i think that's the why the word working is in the um description of this first stage for you know a, a, a other other um disciplines away from ta might have i think and things like an accurate formulation or a a comprehensive analysis or a i can't think i was just thinking what you might have in counseling but in ta it's often a comprehensive script analysis where you've looked at the uh, or you've talked with the client about how the first how their plan or how can i put this their unconscious life script yeah have been formulated and in ta the uh, negative messages and the positive messages and the early decisions that were formed that makes up the unconscious life plan, which in TN is called script. That's why this is called script analysis. So in the first stage, you're working towards getting an accurate script analysis as well as building fundamental human attributes around trust and uh, genuineness and uh, a, 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 an accurate sense of attunement I think they all make up this first stage. And of course, in the, again, in TN, it might not be the same. I know it certainly isn't in Gestalt psychotherapy, for example, but TA certainly, uh, w what you would include in this first stage is a contractual process. In other words, there's a bilateral contract between the therapist and client um, developed not only at overall level in terms of what the person wants to achieve and perhaps more importantly how they might sabotage themselves achieving that um this would make up the contract um overall but also maybe what makes up a sessional contract at the same time what does a person want from their the session first session third session etc etc so you've got two aspects of contractual theory but in establishing a work alliance, um, contractual method is really important. So we've got contractual method, we've got script analysis, we've got a sense of achievement, we've got trust being built, we've got getting to know each other there. Um, I think they those are the things that build up a first stage in psychotherapy for me. Yeah. Is that how you see it as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Anything and to add, do you think? Say that again, sorry. Is there anything to add from your frame of reference in this working stage that we're talking about? I don't think so, no. I think I think you've pretty much got everything 
there I think that attunement and you know the working together at, at the right pace and all that sort of stuff I think that's really important and it's not something that happens on the first session this is something that's going to build up over time mm -hmm. yeah that's right and also in the first stage what I often like to do with my clients is talk about how the past affects the present yeah yeah and usually you might call this executive adjective therapy I don't know usually not only a discussion about what how the past affects the present but really a little bit about what psychotherapy is so as well as getting a contract explaining to them what psychotherapy is and a little bit about how the past affects the present and that leads on to a script analysis and in that of course you've got contracting as well and in that how they might sabotage themselves achieving the contract yeah i think that makes up the first stage now the question is how which is the next question was how do we know when we've achieved that well for me of course it's one when we've actually finalized a contract yeah. And we've finalised and talked about and explored how a person might sabotage their contract, which they will by almost by definition, because otherwise they wouldn't be in therapy. They would have achieved what they wanted. So, um, you know, that's a, another way of knowing perhaps when we've achieved the working lines, when we've got a accurate behavioural, observable, specific um contract in mind and it's been some therapists may not do this and it's been signed by both parties yeah now, now not all therapists will ask their clients to sign the contract um i don't know do you no no but quite a few ta therapists the original do. one i do that you know the the, the practical arrangements for the session not oh, necessarily okay. the contact okay. if that makes sense but that's another thing i had included in the first stage i was talking about treatment contracts yeah the business contract will be in that first stage almost before you begin therapy yeah i get them to sign that side of things you know that they won't turn up under the influence and cancellation policy and all that sort of stuff they sign that but not the the treatment plan they come with part of that initial contract I say you know what are you hoping to get out of a therapy or why are you coming to therapy and you know what do you want to get out of it so there's a little bit of it but it's not an in-depth oh, oh. yeah so there's the maintenance contract so the admin contract and this treatment contract as I said um exploring how they might sabotage that yeah contract is really important I think and then again, an accurate formulation or an accurate script analysis, looking at the negative messages um, and the drivers that make up the early decisions that the client makes becomes part of this early stage. And um, within all that lot, we know when uh, uh, the working alliance has, I won't say been finished, but uh, it's working, is when there's an element of trust and genuineness between the two people, client and the therapist. Yeah. I think they all make up the first stage. Yeah. And am I right in thinking that the the, the contract is, you know, adaptable? Because <laughs> I know that people have come to see me with one thing in mind and then we've kind of something else has happened in their life and that's taken over. So it's not like it's written in storm. No, no, it isn't, Jack, but... No, it isn't. It's not, <laughs> not, and also, um, you may have an overall contract. So somebody comes to you and says, well, I don't really know why I'm here. Yeah. However, um, I have a level of anxiety and depression and stress in life that I'd like to change. Yeah. Um, and then you would explore what you would, what you want, what the client once instead of feeling depressed, stressed and everything else. Yeah. Um, and then you make the contract. And that's an overall contract. Now, in the sessions that follow, which could be yeah, six to 160, um, 
you may meander into many different areas of their life. Uh, <laughs> talk about many, many, many things. Um, and you probably have lots of sessional contracts to do that. Yeah. But that doesn't take away the overall contract that you made at the beginning. Absolutely. Not, yeah. You know, not mutually exclusive. They sort of work together. Yeah. The contract somehow will fit into the overall contract. Yeah. So I think you know when you built up a working alliance in your guts, you'll know that you, how, how you two get on. You'll know um, whether trust, a sense of trust has been established. Uh, you'll know through an accurate contractual method. Uh, you will have established an accurate script analysis. And then you'll probably decide uh, where, where you go from then, which takes us into the second stage. I forgot, one thing I forgot, which Eric Byrne talked about, who's the originator of transaction analysis, who talked about in this first sequence or first stage of a psychedelic process, it's important to do an accurate ego state analysis as well as script analysis. Now, away from TA, you wouldn't necessarily be doing that, um, but in transaction analysis, Eric Byrne did talk about in this first stage of psychotherapy process, which is, you know, in sort of uh, general terms, might be called working alliance, establishing a working alliance, you would do, as well as a script analysis, an accurate ego state analysis, which is oh. now analyzing which or how much energy is present uh, when they actually present and from what ego state. So if they're coming generally from uh, an active parent ego state in energetic terms, they will be, they will have a lot of energy in um, parent behavior or parent or parent language, like must do this or should do this or yeah. ought to do this. Um, and they may be presenting just like their further father did or their mother did or or a significant other that brought them up might do then for simplicity's sake the adult ego state comes do they have a lot of presentation in the adult you know which is coming from the age that they are yeah. the baby, from the age they are or do they have do they present many from their younger self or childlike state um so Eric Byrne will talk about doing a ego state analysis just to look at which ego state they spend most of their time in. And why that's important? Why that's important, of course, is if they spend a lot of time in their younger self, which often might be quite confused, then um, problem solving. May become, may become quite difficult because they're attempting to problem solve without without the adult resources they've got around themselves. Yeah. Or they might be they might come from a younger self which is depressed, which mean and again often is the person's not able to access the adult resources around them to actually change. Yeah, but, I think it's quite difficult on on first meetings or or the first couple of weeks to assess anything because all the defense mechanisms are going to be up do you know what i mean they're, they're not going to be the true self in the room i don't think on that first session there's going to be a lot of protecting themselves against you because they haven't got a clue who you are basically to start off with well eric burn used to say you know and i'm sure who's here probably say oh, i'm going to answer it's probably in the first two, three, four sessions, you can have a hunch. Yes. Perhaps. Yes, definitely. From an intuitive yeah. place. Yeah. And he, I think he's actually said in his first book, you might take up to 20 sessions to get a more accurate ego state. Yeah. And I think this is the difficulty with psychotherapy when people criticise it and say that it, it takes a long time you know, to, to do anything. The, the reason why is you, you are working with and through 
all the defense mechanisms and survival mechanisms and everything to get to the authentic person. And that's yeah. hard. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also it's true and accurate. So, you, you know, you might want to say the first sequence of the first stage of a psychotherapy process, we might want to call the defensive stage. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's how I see it. When people come in, yeah. they, they, there's usually some sort of a, a front or a barrier or whatever it is, even though they've sought you out, they're on the back foot and they're on the defensive. So some people might see the first stage of a psychotherapy process working through working collectively through people's defense processes. Yeah. So, so that's an interesting one, isn't it? It doesn't always have to be, you know, there's different ways of looking at the first stage. I think that that's too, and I think. I think you can work through people's or at least work towards understanding or working through whatever phrase we want to use people's defense systems and still be building up a working alliance yes. to go together. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not about you knocking them down forcibly. It's about them kind of relinquishing something and, and yeah, not needing them as much. Oh, I see the first stage very much about and just, um, is observational. In other words, noting those defence systems yeah. and allowing those defence systems to play themselves out. Because unless you do that, two things are going to happen. One, you won't see how the script being played out. Yeah. yeah. Secondly, if you hammer on the door about people's defence systems, uh, you run the risk of them all running away anyway and you won't see them yeah um and thirdly i think it's really important to honor people's defense systems absolutely because that's how they've got to where they are they've they've needed them yeah absolutely so that then um, so it's not about knocking through them at all but it's i think just observing the defense systems honoring the defense systems and then that will take you into maybe if we want to compartment compartmentalize sequences uh which I'm not too much, you know, advocate from because I don't necessarily see psychotherapy processes as linear. But for the sake of this podcast, um, that will take us to, in TA anyway, would be um, often called a very long description name, if you want, but I think it's pretty accurate. We would be working on um, deconfusing the child ego state which means working with the younger self or means exploring how the past affected the present yeah. or means working with the unconscious part of the self, any of those ways of describing the second stage. I, I think that um, work with the unconscious part, working with the younger part, working with clearing up the confusion in the younger self are pretty good descriptions of the next yes. day. Yeah, yeah. Would you say that? I would. I would agree, definitely. Because if we take as red, and I hope we can, or the listeners can tell it's red, but you might not do, of course, which is fine as well, um, that the early decisions that we make it about ourselves, the world, and other people shape how we run our lives today a zillion percent yeah right. so if, if those decisions if those decisions if you like are made from a dysfunctional or in a dysfunctional environment then they don't particularly help for a healthy process today yeah so that's what i mean by working with the younger self or the unconscious self, TA called deconfusing the child ego state, going back to the history and yeah. look at what decisions the person makes which help them then get through the, you know, what was going on. Absolutely, system, yeah, yeah. But doesn't necessarily help them today. Yeah. So and for me, one of the big things is to have an awareness around that. Yes, definitely. Yeah, 
yeah. So that the person uh, is aware of how things perhaps don't help themselves today. Yeah. And of course, they may feel a certain way, but you're, what you're talking about is helping people have an adult awareness that even if they feel a certain way, it doesn't mean that it's particularly healthy today. Yeah. So that, that's what you mean, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it, it served its purpose. It got you to where you are now, but you, you're not that child anymore. You're an adult and you've got a lot more arsenal in your pocket, so to speak, that you can use. Yeah, it's the feelings that it evokes, I think, that bring the awareness to light. That's right. So, you know, I think a focus of this second stage is helping the person make connections between past and present. Yes, yes. Which is really the major focus of this stage, I think. Yeah. We call it deconfusing the child ego state, whether we call it working with the younger self, whether we call it working with the unconscious. I think it's about maybe helping the person make connections in past and present and being aware of that. Yeah. Absolutely. And then the last stage, I presume, is just bringing it all together and what we can do about it. <laughs> uh, the third, well, I see four stages. But, okay. <laughs> but I know what you mean, the next stage. Yes. Um, so the next stage, I think, is once they've made connections about past and present, how, how do they then put a new script on the road? They've done the script analysis. They made the connections. Yep. Yeah, yeah, often, yeah. Often cognitively emotive from a feeling place. I see the next stage is about making new redecisions, if you like. Yes. Yeah, so th that's what I see as the next stage. So it, being aware of the connections and moving then to making new decisions, which are more healthy, and letting go of the not so healthy decisions so they could put a new plan or script on the road. Yeah. Now, that's a lot of work. That's, you know, the first two stages, I'm not saying the first two stages aren't, but if, if you're going to go to the third stage, where then they've made the connections and they now understand that or have a desire to move to or have the motivation to move to a new script. It's a very big jump. It's like, I think one, you get to the stage where they've got a cognitive awareness or even awareness from their feelings, but then to make these new decisions is a whole another stage yeah. I think, in the psychotherapy process and many techniques um which we may or may not have gone through in these podcasts which helps a person make these new redecisions but to let go of their old script or their old decisions which had been with them such a long time and forms probably part of their identity is no mean feat and usually very scary and overwhelming for the person absolutely yeah and i think <laughs> one of the things i often think about is that it's all done out of awareness and suddenly you've brought it all into their consciousness that these are the the decisions that they've made and this is how the past is affecting it all and it it's it's difficult to let go of something that is an unconscious thing that you're doing. Oh. I don't, I don't know that I'm acting on my script. I just make decisions. Uh, you're right. Sense. You're right, Jackie, but in a, you're right. I'm not taking that away seriously, but you're right. But I think that in a, the sort of process we're talking about here, I think that in the second stage, They've made a lot of cognitive awarenesses yeah. to past and present. They've made those connections. Yeah. And through the work that you do with your client, as they make those cognitive awarenesses, which hopefully hopefully get based up feelings as well, but anyway, expression of feelings as well, they've realized the connections. They talk about the new decisions 
or what could go in its place. So they have, so they start to have that awareness. Then they need to go to the first stage of letting go of this old script, which I'm saying is really not so easy because it's built up with their identity. I, I think if they've done the second bit, which is a cognitive awareness process, so they know where they're heading, even though it's not easy work, they at least have a contractual direction they're going to. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And with the support of you in the therapy room and, you know, being able to practice it and then come back and, and all that sort of stuff. It, it's doable. Of course it's doable, mm. but it's not easy. No. And it really isn't because I said, as I'm, as I'm saying, really, it's those decisions have served them well. Yeah a lot of their life it forms part of their personality constructs and identity and even though they may cognitively realize or even have a desire to let go and change parts of these destructive processes it's not easy to let go of the way that you've thought felt and behaved many many yeah. times before it's not easy to stop habits. We know that, don't we? Yeah. Uh, in fact, I think it's the most challenging part of a therapy process, actually. Yeah, me too. When you get to the change, when we get to the part where they've made these awarenesses, they know maybe a little bit where they're heading, but they find it so hard to do. And That's I can remember when I was starting to make those changes, when I was going through my training and the therapy process and everything is having a real sense of impending doom sometimes and a proper wobble what I would call a wobble and not really knowing what that was about other than something was shifting something was changing and I couldn't quite put my finger on what it was and do you know what kept you in therapy at that time because if you had an impending sense of doom and the way you're describing that it's then I believe clients some clients Run. Yeah, I think for me, because I was doing my training as well as going through personal therapy. So I think I had some understanding of this is normal. This is mm. this is part of the process, mm. Mm. even though it feels really uncomfortable. And, and it, at times I can remember it being quite scary. But I knew it was part of the process. Mm. Which I think is why I like TA, because it's educational. You know, I, I talk to my clients about the wobbles and that that feeling that something just isn't quite right. Taking your hand off the steering wheel. Do you know what I mean? You need to really focus on that momentum of, of instilling the new values and new rules and new everything that you've got. Mm. I, uh, I had a client who recently that got in touch with me. And I think it was from about 15 years ago. And um, I've had this a couple of times, by the way, but I'm just thinking of this person. And uh, she'd included me in a book she'd written. Uh, wow. uh, book she'd written was the therapy or some of the therapy she did with me. And I'm just thinking about it now. And it was very deep work and often two times a week and being in a group towards the this stage that we're talking about and if I was to, I'm sure that if I was to ask her what kept you coming to therapy in the very difficult times we're talking about I am certain she would say you yeah and I think it's the relationship which holds and contains the whole process which the person can hold on to and feel anchored to get through these challenging, difficult times. Yeah, it is. It's that anchor. Yeah. And I know you were in therapy, but I also bet my bottom dollar, whoever was your therapist, it's that relationship, is, you know, which probably that you trusted enough to be able to steer yourself through difficult times mm. without that therapy is very very 
difficult. Yeah. And may not actually happen because you you probably well you have to have you have to be able to lean on the therapist and that's why the first stage of psychotherapy which is building a working alliance getting the trust established having a genuine and sincere relationship where you can lean on your therapist in a dependable way is so vital without yeah. that there that structure is not there to be able to do the therapy that's needed. Yes. Yeah. When I think people go. Or may never even go into the third stage because they know they haven't got a dependable other person. Yeah. To be able to go there with. You just teeter on the edge of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, do, so the, the, this stage of letting go of destructive behaviors, letting go of destructive habits, uh, making new re-decisions, putting healthy scripts on the road, leads us to the fourth stage, uh, which I, I, I would call, a, we have several words we can say, integration, uh, putting it all together. Let's call it integration. As, as, as sort of, I mean, we'll say the fifth stage would be termination then, so it's five stages. Let's say the fourth stage might be called the integrating stage. Which is, you've made all these new re-decisions, you've uh, let go of many of the destructive behaviours, you've got a more healthy script. But you know what? You've now got to practice it. Yes. You've got to test it out. And that's what it is. It is practising and testing, yeah. And you need to do that with your therapist. Yeah. I believe, because it's too difficult to do it on your own. The people that might leave therapy after the fourth stage would have just described without doing the integration bit with the therapist often leave therapy at a time where they're then if they don't go through the next stage of doing it with their therapist and integrating them they're actually in a situation which usually is like their history which is being alone again and not supported and yeah. having to attempt to do what is what is very hard in many ways by themselves yeah so they need to do this integrating testing process with a supportive dependable person that is witness to their journey yeah i believe yeah absolutely because it can be another excuse me another form of sabotage if if they're you know they leave at that point because they're not gonna have that safety and security in order to practice what it is that they're doing and it can just be a way of self-sabotaging and not making the changes couldn't agree more once that's all happened the fifth step the fifth stage have i said we've to which is yeah. terminal which is terminating and ending the therapist the uh whole process and of course that might take initiation by the therapist because the client who's trusted you and having the health has gone on for a long time um so things they might not know when the right time to end is they may um need the help i think of the therapist to have a healthy supportive ending and yeah. there may be a person of course who's always had unhealthy endings in the first place. Yeah. So I think it takes the co-creation of two people to move through the termination. Part. Yeah. Yeah, and for me, it's it's them knowing that I'm not going anywhere and that I will still be there because, yes, with the, they've sorted out, you know, the the life script and the, the fundamentals of it all and, and the life is going quite well, but then life has a wonderful way of throwing us a curveball every so often. So it's yeah. not that right. something might happen and they need to come back again. You're right. So if we recap, recap those sequences or stages, do you want to do that or shall I? Go you go for it. Yeah. So the first stage we've called... Um, Let's call it developing a work alliance. I quite like that. Yeah. Stage. And in that stage, it's about contractual theory, um, script analysis, maybe some ego state analysis, building up trust, building up that solid, secure base where two people 
can start their journey together. That then leads on to what some people might and TA call de de deconfusing the child ego state stage. I'm going to call working with the younger, the younger self, if you like, and helping the person being aware of um, you know, the confusion often in the child's ego state, if you want to put it that way, where they have difficulties in accessing adult resources. Another way of looking at it is sorting out contaminations. They may feel they're in their child, but they're actually in their adult. Yeah. They might feel in their parent ego state, but they're actually in an adult ego state. So sorting out when they know where they're in different parts of the self and helping building up a more robust adult in the here and now. And I liked what you said, actually, um, working through the defences. Well, not working through the defences, but helping them understand and being aware of their defence systems um, in a sort of honourable way. Yes, yeah. Um, then we go to the third stage. What do we call the third stage? I think we call making connections didn't we was that new dis new redecisions or oh, yeah, yeah. fourth is redecisions yeah. yeah uh first stage is third stage is making connections and helping them make connections from the for how the past affects the present and we've started that already in the second stage but i think we're really now starting to firm up the connections between past and present and also in the third stage Though we're calling connections, often what comes here, of course, is uh, working with the parent ego state and the dominant toxic narratives. But I still think the focus is to help the person make connections between the disconnected self, um, between the parts of themselves they've cut off to survive, um, connections between past and present. I think that's all in the third stage. And then from that, we then move on to um, when we sorted out, taken ownership of the past we've cut off, and brought them back in, if you like, or when we've done some of the desensitization around the parent ego state and work more to a unified whole, uh, we then move on to, I think, um, making new redecisions. Well, let's call it the redecision phase. Yeah. Where we'll start to make new decisions and let go of some of the unhealthy part of the script. And once we've done that, that moves us to the in next stage, which is the integrating stage and how you put it all together. Uh, test out the new decisions that you've made. Um, into that's why I like the word integration. It's much more of a whole process. And when all that's done, you move to termination. That's how I see the sort of general sequences of an overall psychotherapy process. Yeah. So it's not just a, a beginning, a middle and an end. I think we've got up to about seven stages there, Bob. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, we could, yeah, people, I often talk about beginnings, middle and ends, but I think the middle is the, I think the beginning and we'll stretch out the beginning could be the first two stages. The middle stage could be the third and fourth. And then the end could be, termination you know so you correct the stages within the middle the, the beginning middle and end but if you go through all that it's about it's quite a in-depth comprehensive you know journey absolutely where, absolutely where, where, yeah where we're witnessing you know transformation yeah every step of the way mm -hmm. yeah that's so, been really good bob uh, yeah, I hope people have liked that. And it's often, if you went on a training program to be a psychotherapist, you may take four years to learn how to do that. And longer because you're continually learning. Oh, all the time. I mean, I I put some of my thoughts down in this podcast, which is half an hour in length or 40 minutes in length. But, uh, but of course, it's just a very overall snippet but I hope it's been useful anyway. Yeah, definitely. So until next time, Bob, when we'll be talking about troubles and triumphs in the therapy process. Oh, 
I'm I'm not really a narcissist narcissistic person, but I quite enjoy celebrating. You're gonna let it all come out in the next session. Celebrating triumphs. Until next time, Bob. Speak soon. Okay, thank you. You've been listening to The Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.